Yo, this is Jumping Jack Frost. And welcome to the Frost Report. Boom! Boom. Yo, yo, everyone, welcome along to another edition of The Frost Report. Today, I'm literally in over my head, but I've decided that I've, I think it's a really important show to, to do today because I literally know nothing about this subject. Today, we are talking about the menopause, and I'm joined by two very, very distinguished ladies who are going to explain to you all about the menopause today. I don't know anything. And the thing about it, I think that us guys should know more about it. I've gone through my whole life hearing this word of menopause, but being totally oblivious and almost a bit ignorant to what it's really about and the effects it has on our better halves, guys. Introducing Diane Danzibrick and Andrea Swan, who are going to both tell you like exactly what they do and earn their qualifications, rah, 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 rah. So... <laughs> First of all, Diane. Thank you, Frost, for doing this. It's really important to be putting this out on a channel like this. Um, you're absolutely right. None of us are ever taught anything about it, men or women. Um, so how I sort of came to be involved in this area, if you like, um, is that by background, um, I'm a therapist and a wellbeing consultant. But 10 years ago now, I had to have surgery that um, removed my ovaries and my womb. And that threw me into a surgical menopause um, at the age of 45. I knew nothing about surgical menopause. And I thought that menopause was hot flushes and no more periods and happened to women in their 50s. So I got no information before my surgery about being in surgical menopause, and I got none before I left the hospital. And I went home um, and thought, okay, get healthy, do as much as you can. And for the first two or three months, I was okay. And then at around three months, things started to change quite dramatically for me. Um, my mental health really fell off a cliff. So things like crushing anxiety, really low mood, my sleep was destroyed, I became more and more agoraphobic, didn't want to leave the house, didn't want to see people, had to stop work. Um, my husband was really, really worried. My mum was really, really worried. They tried to persuade me to go and see the doctor. I was terrified because I genuinely felt as though I was going mad. I had no idea that this was related to the huge loss of estrogen that I'd had when my ovaries were removed. And long story short, about seven or eight months after my surgery, I came incredibly close to taking my own life one day. Wow. Um, I was really fortunate that when I told my husband, he, rather than ask me, he got in contact with our GP and said, could somebody see me that day? I went along to see her and she sat me down. I sat and blubbed all the time and she sat me down and she said, what's been going on? And I explained and she said, it's okay, I know what's wrong. And that was a huge relief. And then she took the time to explain to me that having my ovaries removed had reduced the amount of estrogen in my body dramatically. And for some people, it's not fair to say for everybody, but for some people that can have a significant effect on their mental health. So for me, I wasn't having lots of hot flushes. It was all about my mental health. And she said, there's something that I can offer you to help with this. And she said it was HRT. And then I got all scared again because I'd heard all the scary stories that had ever been about HRT. <coughs> Um, and she explained, no, things are very different now. Um, it's very safe. It's absolutely what you need. And I kind of slapped the first HRT patch on that day. Yeah. And from then on, I, the world had felt really dark and really scary to me. 
to the point where I didn't really feel like I wanted to be here anymore. And from that day, within probably a week or so, it didn't feel quite so terrifying. And that kind of made me think, okay, maybe there's some hope for me. And over the next few weeks and months, the relief that I felt turned into anger yeah. because I started to think, why the hell did nobody tell me before my surgery? Why didn't I have this information? And then I started to question how many other people have been left to go through this. I started to research, did what we all do, you know, turn to social media, the internet, um, which was just coming across thousands and thousands of women saying things like, please help me. I don't know who I am anymore. I feel like I'm going mad. I feel so alone, et cetera, et cetera. And on one particular occasion, I kind of knew that I was feeling a bit more like myself because I turned to my husband and I said, this is ridiculous. How the hell has this been allowed to happen? If things, if, if I ever feel like me again, I'm going to make damn sure I do something to change it. And that's kind of how I get to sit here, how I started the organisation Menopause Support and then the national Make Menopause Matter campaign. That's great stuff. And, and Andrea? Looking back now, I think I started symptoms quite early. I mean, I can remember going to doctors at 41 and saying, my memory's really bad, you know, and she just went, oh, well, it's just your age. And I thought... I'm 41, I'm not 81, you know. Yeah. And then, you know, things go on. I get sort of joint aches and pains. And then my, I had got two daughters and they, they were teenagers at the time, which is never fun for anyone. So that was really stressful. But I just found I wasn't coping with it very well. I was struggling to deal with worrying about them and everything. And um, Diane was treating my daughter. My, my eldest daughter got endometriosis. So Diane was treating her for laser therapy. But I knew she was a counsellor. So I said, can I come and just talk to you so we were having counseling sessions and then you know getting through it all um and I'd been put on antidepressants I mean it's partly my fault because I'd gone and said I just feel really anxious I'm dealing with stress yeah. so they'd given me that but um after one session one week I said to Diane oh, I keep getting these hot flushes so she got her little symptom checker out and I sat there and I was just tick 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 oh my god you know I didn't realize all of these were symptoms I just thought it was part of getting older so um, she get, you know, told me what, to, so I took the nice guidelines with me and wrote down what I wanted. And luckily, I mean, the doctor didn't know much. She said, oh, I'll give you tablets. And I said, no, I don't want tablets. I want patches. That's the best, safest type that I would like. And yeah, within, within a week, and I was lucky, like Diane, I started to feel this mood lift because it was, you know, it was affecting home. It was affecting my, my relationship with my husband. Um, the girls were like, you know, what mood is she going to be in today? Yeah. It was really difficult. Um, and then I just thought, well, if I don't know, I read a lot of stuff. And I, if I don't know all of this, then a lot of my friends mustn't know. So I, um, I just asked Diana if she would come to my house one day and do a little talk for all my friends. So I invited like 30 people around my age off Facebook and they all came and did a talk and I, could see them all sitting there thinking oh, that's me I've got that you know I've got you yeah. do that you know all of this sort of thing and I thought well I want to do it again so I asked her and she did another one and then I just said is there anything it actually it was my husband who said why don't you ask Diane if she wants help yeah. so because we had the support group then and there was about 2,000 women in it so I became a moderator on the support group I and mean, there's now 31,000 women in the mm -hmm. support group but um so I became a moderator and then Diane set up menopause support as a community interest company so now I'm the office manager and I do all the emails and the admin and awesome. yeah that's what we do I will say something because a couple of friends of mine when they were aware that you were coming on on, on the show mm -hmm. and um, one of them I won't say her name one of them is a member of your Facebook group right. and she saw she said oh my god I'm a member of that Facebook group <laughs> it helps so much and I was like okay I've got the right people in it right and one of the reasons why I wanted to do this is because Basically, all the closest women to me in my life are going through this right now. And I wanted to understand it. And I wanted there to be a more of a general understanding with men and women so people could know what they're going through. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I've got some questions here, right? Okay. How many stages of menopause are there? And can you briefly explain each one? Yeah, sure. So we use the word menopause to cover what can be quite a lengthy transition for some people. Um, so for the vast majority, they will be perimenopausal by the time they're 45. So perimenopause means around the time of menopause. Menopause really means the end of periods. Wow. But 
for some people, that can go on for quite a while. So if you're somebody who's in a natural menopause, so that's where the ovarian function is changing, the hormone levels are changing, at around 45, doctors would expect most women to be in that stage of life. Um, you might be symptomatic. Around three out of four will have symptoms. And perimenopause into what we call postmenopause. So, postmenopause is the years after you've stopped having periods. On average, that lasts between four and eight years. That's for a natural menopause. Then you have people like me who are thrown into surgical menopause. That's where you have your ovaries removed. Yeah. So that's everything all at the same time. Wow. Then you have those who go into a medical menopause. So that's where they might have treatment. It could be maybe treatment for something like cancer that has an effect on their ovaries. That's a medical menopause. But then they might have medication to actually stop the ovaries functioning. So perhaps people who have really severe endometriosis, probably a condition you've heard of, um, or another condition called PMDD, that's premenstrual dysphoric disorder. That's a really severe form of PMT. Those people might be offered medication to essentially stop their ovaries functioning. Mm -hmm. But that then puts them into this menopausal phase. So they could then, although the PMDD or the endometriosis is being helped, it can then put them into a place where they're having menopausal symptoms. And then we have to think about those who go through menopause really early. So you have early menopause under the age of 45 or premature menopause, which is under the age of 40, one in a hundred under 40, one in a thousand under 30, and one in 10,000 under 20. Wow. So the youngest person that I've counseled through a premature menopause is 17. The youngest we know of is 12. So 12 is incredibly rare, but you think about the amount of people you know, know. one in a hundred under 40, it's not that rare at all. Yeah, it's crazy. Like when you think about it like that, it is, and it's like, <sighs> You know, me as I, as I said when we when, when when we first started speaking, um, I've been guilty as just like millions of guys around the world of not being very helpful with my comments. It's the same with any subject. If you don't teach somebody about something, how can you expect them to have an understanding of it? Yeah, and if we're we, not even taught about it. No, so how nobody. Would a man understands. It's crazy. Exactly, yeah. nobody's taught about it. Because I, I will say, I'm going back. Sorry, mum. By the way, I remember. <laughs> <laughs> when my mum was going through it, right, she used to have like a big massive fan. And I used to be like, well, you got the fan on, mum? Do you know what I mean? And she just like, <laughs> and I just, you know, and bless her. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like now I sit and I think, oh my God, I was just, I was just not helpful at all. Do you know what I mean? But it wasn't spoken about so much then either. So a lot of women no. didn't feel comfortable talking about it. And there Absolutely. are certain cultures that still don't talk 100%, about it. 100%, yeah. 100%, yeah. 100%. Yeah. Many of my female friends suffer with low uh, um, depression and like low like self-esteem and mood stuff, not knowing the reason was only to find out their perimenopause. Why do so many women suffer in silence and what is being done to increase awareness? Like we said, they're not, you're not told about it, so you think you're the only person feeling like that. And you don't want to talk to your friends about it because you think they're not going to understand. And you will see like big friendship groups, so many different variations of symptoms. And if you think you're the only one that's feeling like that and you can't understand why, and then you'll go to the doctor. And if your doctor's not well informed, they will offer you antidepressants, yeah. which that seems might to be the help for a, sometimes, yeah, right? It might help for a little while, but it, if you're low in estrogen, antidepressants aren't going to bring those levels up. You're not going to feel any better. Um, I mean, Diane started the Make Menopause Matter campaign and we've already achieved one of the aims, which was getting menopause added to the school curriculum. Also, we wanted to uh, improve the situation in workplaces. So all workplaces had a, some sort of, you know, support network. And also we want GPs uh, trained because we did a survey last, it was the beginning of this year, wasn't it? Yeah, we contacted yeah. all the medical schools last in the year, country yeah. and asked them, freedom of information, asked them, what do you teach about menopause? And 41% of them don't teach about menopause at all. That's crazy. And considering uh, we're half the population yeah. and there's so many other health issues that come from menopause. So 
women are going to the doctors with palpitations and joint aches and pains and they're being referred on to rheumatology and cardiology and psychology, yep. urology, when actually if they were given or just, you know, discussed menopause, yep. had some HRT if that's what they wanted, that all those things would be sorted out, less money would be wasted on the NHS, all these referrals and all these, Mr. you know, appointments, misdiagnosis. So hopefully there, there seems to be some change. We've got the women's health strategy where they want to, uh, they're now all students from 24, 25 yeah, will all, be taught, won't yeah, they? Yeah, all medical students will receive mandatory menopause training from that's 2024. Fantastic. I think that's, yep. like given what I'm just, a little bit of what, I'm, what I've learned <laughs> today and from my research that I've done and by, you know, I've been having like amazing female friends who have kind of helped me to understand a little bit and prepare me for for today. Yeah, it's, I think it's it's a real shame that it hasn't been like more represented in the in our school curriculums. And as you said, like females are like half the population. Like, well, we're taught we're taught in school. We're taught about periods. You're taught yeah. about how not to get pregnant. You're taught about when you are pregnant. You know, yeah. and then that it stops there. And it's like, well. You'll be it's almost like a taboo. It's yeah. almost like a taboo. Like, let's not talk about yeah. it. Like, and like not a... everyone will have a baby or not everyone will get pregnant, but we will all be going through the menopause. Yeah, it's so... crazy, it's crazy. The NHS may prescribe hormone replacement therapy, HRT, but some GPs won't prescribe it at the perimenopausal stage, yeah? Can you recommend any alternatives such as bioidentical natural hormone replacements or any vitamins or minerals which may help with some of the symptoms? Okay, so before we go to recommending or suggesting other things, we have to talk about the fact that HRT is on the national formulary. So it's... GPs should not be refusing to prescribe it. Wow. So unless, unless somebody, and it really shouldn't be a refusal, it should be a discussion. Mm. If somebody's got a medical condition, which means that HRT is not the right option for them, then if the GP doesn't feel that they can help to manage their care, they should refer them to an NHS menopause specialist. What often happens is that people will go along with symptoms. They might be, say, 43, 44, and doctors will say, you're still having periods, you can't have HRT, you're too young, it can't possibly be menopause. So there's lots of barriers around education and information to people getting the right help, but we shouldn't have GPs refusing a first line of treatment, which it is, it's the most effective treatment for symptoms, we shouldn't have them refusing it to patients because of their own kind of prejudices against it. Yeah. Um, it should be what's so best for the patient. So it's basically, that is what it is, it's like a, their prejudices against it, yeah? Yeah, so what happened is about 20 years ago, there was a big study done in the States called the Women's Health Initiative Study. I probably remember at the time seeing all of those headlines around HRT causes breast yeah, cancer. Yeah, I remember that. So not only the public were put off and a lot of women threw their HRT in the bin, but also a lot of doctors were scared by that. They were really worried. But unfortunately, what hasn't happened is we haven't had that education piece in the meantime to say, actually, things have changed significantly. You know, sort of the latest evidence-based information is that for the vast majority of women under the age of 60, within 10 years of their last period, HRT has significant benefits and very few risks. I mean, what we often say to people is, okay, here's the nice guidance. Go back to the GP, take the nice guidance. We have things on our website like 10 things your GP should know about nice guidance. We have preparing for your GP appointment. So I think the thing is, what's happening is rather than people getting offered all of the options, and there are, there are non, non-hormonal options as well if people don't want HRT, there's an absolute plethora of, of herbal things out there. And the trouble is, is that raising awareness for menopause has been a bit of a double-edged sword because it's great to raise awareness but that opens up marketing opportunities. So what you find yeah, is definitely. you're getting more and more menopause products and services being targeted at vulnerable people, essentially. 
Um, so it's not to say that none of those things work for some people. Some people find that herbs, vitamins and minerals will help them. Um, it all should really be an informed choice. But one of the things I just wanted to pick up on that you mentioned was bioidentical hormones. Yeah. So it's really, really, really important that people know that what they can get from their GP is what the NHS call body identical, HRT. So it's licensed, it's regulated, and the um, the estrogen and progesterone, the body identical estrogen and progesterone, the hormone has the same molecular structure as the hormone that we make naturally. Okay. Now, bioidentical, it's a great example of marketing. Right. It's a marketing term. Right. It came originally from the <coughs> States. And bioidentical essentially is very often the same body identical hormones, but it's not licensed and it's not regulated. So it's made up in what are called compounding pharmacies. Um, sometimes the progesterone part of it. So when, when women who have a womb are given HRT, they get estrogen and progesterone. You have progesterone to protect the lining of your womb from becoming too thick. Sometimes with bioidentical preparations, the progesterone is given as a cream. And that is, that's not a licensed regulated preparation. And what we know from, you know, sort of talking to menopause specialists over the years is that because the molecule in the progesterone cream is too big to be absorbed properly by the body, we know that for some individuals, they haven't had that protection for the womb. Right. And potentially that can cause problems further down the line. So, of course, some people will still choose to go and see a private bioidentical doctor. Probably people living in London are more likely to have access to that. Yeah. Um, but I think it is really important that people are aware of like the safety. Do you think it's so? Do you, do you think it's dangerous, Andrea? What the bioidentical? Yeah. I, I don't know whether it's dangerous, but I think it's um, it's obviously very expensive, and you you don't know what what you're getting. And I think, like Diane said, women feel desperate. They're desperate to get something to make them feel better, yeah. so they're going to these clinics, paying hundreds and hundreds of pounds, yeah. when you can just go to your NHS GP and get Something a better quality effective. and it's registered you know it's regulated it's yeah. licensed it's safe we have a society in the UK called the British Menopause Society so they're kind of you know they're the people that know if you like um, and as far as they're concerned they would certainly not be recommending that people use bioidentical hormone therapy yeah they've got something on their website that yeah. says that and, and actually the the British Menopause Society have got a patient arm, which is called Women's Health Concern, mm -hmm. and they've got amazing information for yeah. all, all different types of women. As you said, people are using vulnerable people to, to target vulnerable people to make money. Yeah, basically. well, everyone's doing it. They're, they're, you know, face creams are now having menopause face cream. You don't need a menopause face cream. You just need a face, face cream, cream yeah. that you like. Yeah. Another aspect here that that I've been aware, made aware of is brain fog. Mm -hmm. In other words, forgetfulness, memory loss, disorientation, confusion, and it's, it's challenging and it's of, often um, anxiety-provoking, yeah? Yeah. Uh, anxiety-provoking part of menopause for some women. Reassuring women that they're not going crazy is critical for their well-being. How can we teach partners, loved ones, and perhaps even colleagues to be more sympathetic and understanding? Well, uh, I mean, this is a, a major thing for a lot of women leave leave their jobs because of this, you know, particularly in things like teaching and nursing and doctors. Yeah. If you feel like you're going to make a mistake that could potentially harm somebody, you're going to lose your confidence and, um, you know, you're going to think, I can't cope with this. And yeah. Like you said, you get anxious, you get stressful, you're going into work and you're thinking, am I going to make a mistake today? I'm going to get sacked. Yeah. Um, but, you know, that that is... That is something that you do need to reassure about. And you just have to adjust things. Like, I've got alarms for everything in wow. my phone. Like, if we've got a meeting in half an hour, <laughs> I'll set a timer. Because it just helps me, and it means I'm not worrying that I'm going to miss something. Because sometimes I'll wake up in the night and think, did I reply to that email? 
What is it? Serious, seriously, that it's like that yeah, bad? Yeah, and and words. You you'll be. To- yeah, I mean, I do it finding. all the time. You're talking mm. to somebody and you can't remember the word for something. Like, what is that thing that cuts the grass in the garden? Oh, it's a mower. Wow. It's it's, it's ridiculous, isn't it? Yeah. I read about um, Gabby Logan saying that she found she was forgetting names of footballers when she was doing her commentary and things like that. Mm. Which you know, you're on live TV. Yeah. That's not great. Yeah. You have little strategies of what's going to help you, and yeah. Anything to add to that? I Ryan? think uh, yeah, I think reassurance wise from a long-term perspective it's really important that not just women but all of us are aware that the brain all of our brains are very neuroplastic so they can change in response to (sighs) what's going on so estrogen we have estrogen receptors from the top of our heads to the tip of our toes there's a lot of it going on in the brain as those hormone levels start to fluctuate that's really why those cognitive, as you say, memory, etc., and psychological symptoms come along. From the point of view of memory, there's been quite a lot of study done on memory and concentration. There's a brilliant book called The XX Brain written by a lady called Dr. Lisa Moscone. She's an American neuroscientist, and she's done loads of research around this. And I think what people can be reassured of is that as you go through that transition, as those hormone levels start to settle, it will be much lower, but as they settle down, for many, many people, particularly memory and concentration, it will kind of resolve, it will be back. So it's like you're kind of going through this storm and then things calm calm down down. and you're okay. And I think, you know, you mentioned partners. Yeah. I think it's really important for partners to know as well because if you know that, I've 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 been I've been like so ignorant and I've been so like oh what now I'll oh, sort your life out sort your hormones out do you know what I mean yeah. like you make jokes yeah. do you know yeah. what I mean and it's not very nice do you know what I mean because obviously someone's really going through something and we have as us as men especially have zero understanding of it yeah. do you know what I mean yeah. and now hearing this I actually feel quite bad because I've not been very helpful <laughs> whatsoever. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, but don't feel bad about it, lovely, because you're not the only one. <laughs> a, you weren't taught. B, you're doing something about it. Men especially seem to lack knowledge about the menopause and be guilty of throwing unhelpful and often cruel comments around, such as you need to sort out your hormones <laughs> or you're acting off key. Obviously, women cannot control what's happening to them, and this general lack of awareness can worsen symptoms, often leading to depression and anxiety. What are your thoughts on this, and what needs to be done to change the attitudes? Okay, so I sound like a broken record. It's all about education and information. I think recognise that if it's your partner, actually she might not necessarily recognise what's going on for her. So for people listening to this, there might be guys listening to this who are going, ping, ping, oh my God. Oh my God. I've just realised what's going on. I've counselled more men about menopause this year than I have in the last seven years. I think that's really good. Men getting in contact with us. But, you know, I've also heard some really, really sad things you know, I've sat in the back of... Whenever I get a cab to go anywhere to do an interview... Yeah, what are you doing? Oh, yeah. And when I say, oh, I'm going to a TV studio to talk about menopause, they're like, oh, you know, we think you're all going mad, blah, blah, blah. You start that conversation, but then you really get into it. Yeah. And they're like, actually, I think my relationship is in trouble because of this. Yeah. I can't even give her a peck on the cheek anymore. I don't, I don't know how to approach it. I don't know how to talk about it. I've spoken to men who have told me, and I'm the only person that knows that they had an affair because of this, yeah. and they live with that every day, yeah. and it breaks their heart that yeah. they did it. Yeah. I'm Tragically, uh, I've spoken to three men this year whose wives have taken their own lives. Oh, my God. As so a result of this. Crazy. Um, you know, the highest rate, of female suicide is between the ages of 45 and 55. We expect everybody to be perimenopausal by the time they're 45. The average age of menopause is between 51 and 52. There's no research to back up what I'm saying, but it's not a coincidence. No, definitely not. It's crazy. So what can you do? The most important things you can do. So on our website, there is a guide, which is called Understanding Menopause for Partners. Educate yourself. 
be as compassionate as you can, be as patient as you can, understand that it's not you. You know, if you, you know, in my husband's situation, when I hissed at him, <laughs> it wasn't God his, bless him. it wasn't his fault, <coughs> but it wasn't my fault either. Yeah. It was my hormones. And I, you know, kind of, I, I really struggled with it. Um, a lot of people will divorce yeah. during menopause. I could have well imagined like, because it's got to be a strain of suddenly your wife or your partner is just changing in front yeah. of your That's eyes. That's what my husband is. Where is Andrea? Where yeah. is she? He's yeah. called me Dennis the Menace. because Oh, just my be like, God. Probably <laughs> to the hair, but yeah. But uh, yeah, Dennis the Menace. I mean, he actually booked in. I didn't know, but he booked in with Diane to have a, a, a session yeah, just to, to understand. And he yeah. came home and apologised to me. And actually, so I gave him the understanding thing for partners, which really helped him. But it wasn't till I gave him my symptoms list and he was just like, oh, my God, I just, he had, not like we all do, we don't have any clue how many symptoms there are until you see it down in front of you. You know, I sit back, I sit here now and think back on little moments and little things I've said and I go, oh, my God. And unless you get this education, where do you we go? That lack yeah. of knowledge, you're just you ignorant I mean? to it all, And it's you? so simple, isn't it? Yeah. It's like, why, why did nobody ever think about this before? Why was it not important? And then you start looking back in history and you look at, you know, sort of the women historically who have been locked up in asylums yeah. during their perimenopause and menopause. And, and it wasn't that you long know, ago, was it's, it? We're only talking about 100 or so years ago. Wow. It's not that long ago. Within the black community as well, because I find that in the black community, I think that women in general might be less likely to even embrace yep. the knowledge and talk about it. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. My understanding of it from a West Indian background, yeah. right, is that they're just going to brush it under the carpet. Within the black community, I think that we are way more off okay. the understanding mm. than any other communities. That, yeah. Do you know what I mean? Okay, so Andrea mentioned earlier, like culturally. Yeah. Um, so we know, you know, kind of, we know that there are some challenges culturally. Yeah. But, you know, there are, there are some black women, there are some Asian women who are talking about their experiences, yeah. which is brilliant. You know, when I set up menopause support, I set it up for everybody. Yeah. We have women of, you know, kind of all cultures mm -hmm. within the group. Um, the campaign is for everybody. Yeah. But I think it is really important that, you know, sort of we we see and we hear everybody in this conversation. Yes. And I think the other thing for particularly black and Asian women is that we don't have a huge amount of research. I mean, we don't have a lot of research for anything yeah. to do with menopause. Yeah. The only bit of research that we've got, particularly around age, for black and Asian women is that they potentially will go through it a little bit earlier wow. than the average. So potentially they will be, we don't know because there's no research, um, but generally they would perhaps start and finish their perimenopause. For many, they will be menopausal in their late 40s, so before they hit their 50s. And again, I think that's really important information to get out there. Yeah. Um, but as you say, you know, kind of, I think the more that we talk about it, the more that we, you know, kind of bring everybody with us, you know, you doing this today, I think that's a great conversation opener. Yeah, yeah. Because when we talk about better menopause care and support, we want better menopause care and support for everybody. Yeah. We want it for those individuals who, within their cultures, um, and this is quite often in South Asian cultures, there's no word for menopause. Wow. There is no encouragement to talk about menopause or women's health within their culture. Why do you think that is? Well, that's historical. That feeling of aloneness is really isolating. And again, that can stop you from going and seeing a doctor. Yeah. Because if you if you can't find the words to talk about it, there isn't a la the language yeah. to talk about it. That can be really, That's really difficult. Sad. That's really really sad. There's evidence that uh, black women, particularly, uh, and this stuff out at the moment, isn't there that their maternity care isn't as good. Yeah. The outcomes, yeah. and I think you know that the they don't get as good treatment from doctors. It's this is all coming out yeah, now. Definitely. So I think that will make them think well. If I can't get help from the doctor and yeah. I don't want to, talk, you know, I don't feel comfortable talking about it. It just takes that one or two people just to say, come on, you know, 
we're all going through it. I mean, we've we've got Karen Arthur and Nina Kuypers, yeah. and they're raising awareness yeah. that way. So I think you know, if people could it's building use on that, that isn't an, it? use them as an example, yeah. we all just need to talk about it and be more comfortable talking about it to each other. Wow! 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 Is your head blown yet, Frost? <laughs> no, no. It, it's, I find it quite fascinating because, like, you know, obviously, like I'm in my fifty, in my mid fifties now, and you know, it's it's taken. It's taken us to get to this this point here for us to even have this conversation. Do you know what I mean? And I've you know, I've been around my girlfriend and and um, friends and stuff, and they're like, get out of the room, we need to talk about women's stuff. I'm like, what? Get out. It's fascinating and sad at the same time because it's like we could talk about so many other things, but this just seems to be such a, a taboo. Do you know what I mean? There's been an enormous kind of injustice done to women down the centuries. But unfortunately, we're still in a situation today where things like endometriosis takes seven or eight years on average to be diagnosed. Um, we still know that there are lots of women in premature menopause where it takes ages for it to be diagnosed. And that's really just been because a complete lack of um, a complete lack of focus on women's health. You know, when you think about it, women were, weren't included in medical research generally, until the early 80s. Is that serious? Wow. Yeah, so all medication has been tested and based on men. So obviously, you know, kind of the dose that suits a man doesn't necessarily suit a woman. It's completely different. It's a completely different... Yeah, and women's, like, the the heart issues for women is completely different from men, isn't it? Yeah. Um, Things like, you know, you can look at it through all... All areas of life, you know, kind of um, seatbelts yeah. were designed for men. They're not designed for women. So, you know, kind of crash test, test dummies have always been men. Yeah. They've never been women. Yeah, yeah. Completely different. Uh, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. They've just designed the first crash test dummy What's the difference? Um, as a woman. So it's the, it's the amount of force, right, the uh, amount of really weight. Right, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Um, it would be different. Yeah. So, But you can look at all areas of life. And There's a lot things, of work to be done, right? Yeah, things yeah, have basically been designed around, you know, kind of what they call the average man. The work you do now, where's, where do we go from here? Because obviously it's, this education stage is is ongoing. We've got our campaign, our Make Menopause Matter campaign. Um, so you can go and sign the petition. No, seriously. Check out. Hashtag yeah. make men... Look. <laughs> right? Come it's on. serious. It's a serious thing, guys. Come We've on. We've got Guys, I need you to... I need you to Come, sign the jo- petition. Join up with me. Sign a petition. We've got 184,000 signatures so far, haven't we? Yeah. And like I said, we've already rain, uh, managed to get uh, schools to have it added to the curriculum in England and Scotland. Yeah, and Scotland. Yeah. So we want that to continue to uh, the rest of the UK. And and we need to keep pushing for GP. We, I mean, GPs are going to be educated from 24, 25, but really, gonna, we need current be, GPs. Is there going to be like, all right, GPs, we're sending you on a new course to find no, out about no. this. Or, this, that would be no, it's great. For, so 24, 25 is for all medical new students. medical students. So anybody who's going to medical school, yeah. they will learn about menopause. So whatever area they decide to go into in medicine. That's going to be compulsory will, as well. Yeah, absolutely. Great stuff. Um, but as far as our current GPs are, are concerned, the thing is, it would be so simple. It would be so simple. You know, every time that I... Go back and do like a course or something, yeah, right? Yeah, every time I've ever had a meeting with either an MP or a minister... This, the, the changes are really simple. Have a, have a general um, public health campaign for menopause for the whole country. Have it on TV, have it on radio, have it on buses, have it on trains. Yeah. Send everybody around the age of 40 a booklet so that they've got the information. Put the booklets in health centres, in community centres, in GP practices so that anybody can pick one up, men, women, doesn't matter have a standard module to help all our current GPs get themselves up to date. Because to be fair to them, you know, I wouldn't want to be a GP. You know, they are so, so busy. We've got so many leaving because they're so stressed out. Um, But give them the help they need. You know, do a one-hour video module, send it to all of them and say, here you go, guys. Teach all teenagers in school. And then, you know, think back to when you were a teenager if you do, if for all of us, 
If <laughs> for all of us, if we'd have learnt about it, yeah, I would never have been in the situation that I was 100%. in. Nor would Andrea, nor would you. Yeah, seriously. and we can say that for every We've single person. We've understood our mums better. Yeah, our you partners, know, relationships would be saved because you'd, you'd you're more you'd understanding. deal with your colleagues in a different yeah. way when yeah. they're experiencing 100%. it. It's just common sense, 100%. lovely. You know what I mean? It's like whew, I'd have been kinder to. A lot of people, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't horrible, but I haven't, I haven't said helpful things. Mm. You know what I mean, and I'm sure millions of guys around the world are the same. Of course, same. yeah, millions yeah. of people, and even GPs who've had a quite a simple menopause, we hear them saying, "Well, I've got through it, so why just get on with it?" You can get some women that are sort of, "Oh, pull yourself together," and and we see on comments sometimes, don't we, on things that are on social media. Oh, well, oh, I'm sick of this menopause stuff. Just, just. No, stop talking about it and get on with it. And you think, Ooh, well, thank wow. you for being so kind. That is, that's, that's, <laughs> I know, it's really sad. That's, 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 that's crazy because, you know, obviously, whoever said that, they might not have been, but obviously maybe mom, auntie, yeah. someone's gone through it in your family like, and, and had a hard time. Do you know and what I mean? also yeah. the, those women that have had quite an easy time early on, can then go on to have things like osteoporosis and vaginal issues, incontinence. You know, most women in old people's homes are there because of dementia yeah. or incontinence. Yeah. So, you know, that's another thing that needs to be addressed, isn't it? Yeah, it's, um, it's another area where, you know, kind of you look back at things like, you know, your grandmother's um, older aunts and things like that. Yeah. Um, and you think, oh my goodness, you know, these poor women, they've been like spent, hey, they've spent their lives like going around the supermarket buying these pads that they put in their pants. Actually, if they'd have had some local estrogen, that could have helped them. They might not have it's, been in that situation. Because, you, know, you look back at like my grandmother's age and my aunts and stuff like that, and you just, it's only now you see, you think like, what they must have been through. Mm. And, and they stuff. would not have talked about no. it. No. I never spoke about it. No. Never, ever spoke about it. No, no, no. And you think, wow, because a couple of my aunts, they're like, they're like, when are you doing the menopause thing? When are you doing the menopause thing? And I'm like, oh, I'm going to do it. Like, I'm gonna, okay, I'm really looking forward to it. Really, they want to learn as much as, because, you know, they've been through it. Do you know what I mean? And like a lot of them are older now, they've probably been through it and thinking, oh, I just want to connect the dots and make everything make sense, you know? It's there's, crazy. Yeah, there's been far too much of far that. Far too much of it. So I'm going to ask another question, yeah? Why don't we have specialised menopause clinics for women? Surely they would be available nationwide. Um, these women are business leaders, mothers, friends, sisters. We have a duty to support them, right? We do have specialist clinics, but a lot of GPs don't know about them. Okay. But if you go to the British Menopause Society website, yeah. there's a little thing that says find a specialist. Yeah. You click on that, then you can put your postcode in and you can choose private or NHS and it will give you a list of your nearest clinics. However, there are some areas of the country like Devon and Cornwall don't have a clinic yeah. at all. There's a campaign, Where's My Clinic campaign at the moment that people can sign. Uh, Northampton, a lot yeah. of... North not There's about the, 12 the, yeah. counties in the country that, that, don't, don't, have a that don't have a specialist clinic at why do, all. Why do, is there a reason for that? Yeah, it comes down to whether or not the local health authority think that, it's, think, think that it's worth funding. funding yeah. um, so in London, if you live in London or Leeds or Manchester, you're okay. Yeah. Um, there's a few. But as Andrea said, you know, if you go around the country, um, basically it's a bit of a postcode lottery. And the really sad thing is that those specialist menopause clinics were really set up to deal with women who have complex medical history. And very often we will speak to people in those situations and they'll say, you know, like I've been struggling on my own for 18 months, three years, seven years, blah, blah, blah. And you say, but has nobody ever referred you to a menopause clinic? No, didn't even know they existed. I didn't know my, didn't know myself. And, and, and a couple of my friends who have helped me prepare for this show don't know either. Do you know what I mean? So there you go. Yeah, and, and unfortunately, the, 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 there's a long wait for the NHS clinics. But also, you know, sometimes GPs can actually just email the clinic and the specialist and yeah. ask rather just than like having a referral. You, refer you. Yeah. Just yeah. say, look, I've got this lady, blah, blah, blah. Because not most of these ladies don't actually need to go to a specialist. It's just that their GP doesn't feel comfortable or confident enough. So, you know... They'll get referred on, but actually, like if, if, the the GP, the yeah, kind of if the GPs um, could just update a little bit, I think a lot of that list would go down because they could just then say, "Oh, yeah, I know about this." I mean, there's a <coughs> there's a GP troubleshooting guide that we've 
that's been written, which is really helpful. So we yep. send that to a lot of ladies that contact us whose GPs aren't, aren't sort of up to date. And we'll say, you know, it's got all the little things. If your, if your patient's got this, this and this, you can do this. And it's really helpful, isn't it? It seems to me that we've got a kind of commu- communication problem here between the actual facts of what are happening yep. and the GPs who seem to have blinkers on or have their heads in the sand or just don't want to address this. I think to be fair, um, I think to be fair, GPs have been done a similar disservice yeah. to women. Yeah. Because you can't expect somebody to do the job if you don't give them the education to do it. You know, if you think about it, if a GP signs a prescription, they take personal response. That person takes personal responsibility for writing that prescription. It's not on the local NHS, it's down to them. Right. So you can see yeah. that with all that scary stuff going on yeah. and then, you know, kind of the kind of pressure that they're under, more and more patients, fewer and fewer colleagues, something's got to give. But that's why it's important that we provide this module. But, you know... I've counselled some of them who are so burnt out that they don't know what to do with themselves. So they just go, do you know what? I'm just going to leave and do something else. We can't afford to lose them the same way that we can't afford to lose our nurses. So, you know, it's down to, it's really down to the Department of Health, the NHS and the Royal College of GPs to get their act together, put this module in place and say, here you go. And, uh, you know, kind of we've definitely seen in the last few years, we know that there are more GPs who recognise this themselves and go, do you know what? I didn't get the right education. But they're going off and sometimes they're having to pay for that wow. themselves. Wow. They're going off and they're getting educated and they're paying to do that education for themselves. And it's like, no, that's something that should be provided yeah, for them to help their patients. Do, do you think that? people of different classes are more susceptible to deal with it better or be get better treatment or anything like that? Or is it just the same across the board? Um, I think I think there are some differences. Obviously, there's a financial difference. Yeah. You know, uh, if you're thinking, I've got to pay for my kids' food this week, I can't afford to pay for my prescription or whatever. Or, or you might just not have the time or the ability to find out the information that you need as well. We'd have to look at like disparity in socioeconomics. So it could be that you're somebody who you have spare cash. It might be that you're somebody who has lots of spare cash. Well, that gives you choice. And that means that you can go and see a private menopause specialist as many times as you like. There's going to be an awful, probably the vast majority of the population are not in that situation. 100%. Even more so now. Yeah, even, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, You're also, I mean, we regularly see uh, posts on our group from people saying, I'm I'm trying to find the money. So they'll put it on a credit card. Or that we had one lady who did a whip round of her family and they were given her 10 and 20 quid so that she could save up the 300 pounds for a private, initial private consultation. You've got the people that can easily afford it and they have choice. You've got the people who are struggling, but they're put, they're going into debt to do it. That's a disgrace. That should never be happening. And then you've got the people who they probably can't even get a credit card. Yeah. They might not have a bank account. Yeah. You know, it's the last thing in the world they could imagine. Yeah. And what we tend to see there when we look around the country is that what they're offered choice-wise as as you know, management. Do you think the demographic might have something to do with it as well sometimes? I think, absolutely, I think it can do. Um, But, you know, kind of we know that if you're further north in the country, you're probably more likely to get either antidepressants or you might get the tablet form of HRT. So generally, menopause specialists would say, start by having particularly your estrogen through the skin. We have to think about, you know, kind of NHS areas and how they're budgeted. Um, So, you know, kind of there is huge disparity across the country. But I think going back to what we talked about before, you know, kind of some of the cultural issues, you know, some people will never come forward for treatment. Yeah. So Andrea mentioned, you know, kind of running to the loo more often, um, vulval and vaginal symptoms. Those things, 70% of women, full stop, throughout their lifetime 
a lot of them, once they're postmenopausal, so they finish their periods, they will experience those symptoms. 70%, only 7% ever seek any treatment. That is like, this is like phenomenal, like seriously. More urinary frequency or urgency can make it really difficult for people to even venture out of the house. It affects your like, work as well, doesn't it? If you're in a classroom and you're teaching a load of yeah. kids and you yep. need to loo, you can't just leave your classroom. Yeah, with, you know, kind of with work, it's really difficult. Then you think about things like stuff that nobody ever wants to talk about. Nobody yeah. wants to talk about vulvas and vaginas, but hey, we're going to. Yeah. Because this, this is the kind of thing where women then, they don't talk to their partners. They can't even talk to them about what's going on. There's no intimacy. The partner then feels completely rejected because there's no intimacy. Yeah. And the woman is like, well, I can't because it's too painful, but I'm not going to tell you that. Yeah. They stop going for their smear tests. You know, kind of, we're talking about, you know, kind of really important Really tests important here. stuff here, man. Um, you know, kind of, because it's too painful. Like, this is a massive taboo. That is massive. But there is really, really simple, non-invasive treatments, tiny, tiny doses. There's all sorts of things that can potentially be done if only we can find a way to be able to teach about it and, and talk about it. Exactly that. Because those happening. symptoms continue to get worse as well. If you don't address them, they, yeah. they, they continue get to get worse, they need which managing. is why ladies end up in old people's homes because they've wow. become incontinent. But, yeah, it's uh, and relationships break down because yeah, of it yeah. as well. Because Come you're on, not... it's like, you know, relationships, they're going to take a hit, you know? Yeah. yeah. Relationships are going to take a hit. That's gonna Absolutely. Be the first, that's going to be the first thing to take a hit. Yeah. Exactly. You know, I've spoken to so many men now who say, I just feel completely isolated. Yeah. I don't know. In fact, I've spoken to women partnered with women yeah. who have said, I feel completely isolated. Yeah. Wow. They will go through it, but they might just not be experiencing it the same way. Yeah. I don't think it's unfair to say, is it, that there are quite often tears, aren't there, when we're like sharing emails and things. It can be really, really upsetting, you know, to sit and talk to a man who says, I know my relationship's breaking down. I kind of feel like she might have somebody else because we're not having sex anymore. I can't even hug her anymore. And that's probably because she's too scared for you to hug her because she thinks it's going to lead to sex. Oh, my word. And that's going to be so, crazy. that's going to be too painful yeah. oh, for wow. her to experience, but she can't find the words to say it. You have a lot of women come up to you after, when you've done presentations who say, mm. if I'd known this, I probably could have saved my marriage. Coming into doing this show, I had no idea of the extent of the the devastation that surrounds this whole thing. It's... Yeah, I mean, I think it's only fair to say that around one in four will have no symptoms at all. It will just be periods ending. Yeah. But three out of four will, and one in four will describe their symptoms as debilitating, so severely affecting their quality of life. As I said, you know, we know about the current suicide rate for women. We know that around one in 10 will leave their employment. We know that relationships break down. So, you know, it, it sounds as though it's all really negative, but actually with the right help and support, it doesn't have to be at all. People go on to do amazing stuff. Many women suffer at, with night sweats and fl hot flushes during the day, which is incredibly uncomfortable. Is there anything that can be done to control this? So HRT is the most effective treatment for managing hot flushes and night sweats. However, there are other things that people can do. So we know that we know that for some people who can take part in physical exercise, we know that that can help. Well, to it's not, it's not, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That wow. can help to control those. Yeah. But we also know that there are things that we eat and drink that can make those symptoms worse. Wow. So alcohol. Yeah. Ladies. Yeah. Over Christmas, my flush is... Re return every Christmas. Okay, <laughs> ladies. Alcohol, caffeine. So if you're going to drink caffeine, try and keep it to the first part of the day. If you love your spicy food, spicy food can really exacerbate your flashes and your night sweats. Too much sugar, too many of those fizzy energy drinks full of sugar, they can all exacerbate symptoms. There are herbal things, so things like sage, 
black cohosh, red clover. A lot of people will try those off the shelf. Yeah. But it's also worth seeing somebody, if you have the money, it's nowhere near as expensive as seeing a private specialist, but there are people like professional medical herbalists. So for a lot of people, they will feel that's more kind of aligned with yeah. their way of life. Yeah. And you can find a professional medical herbalist in the UK. There's a national register. They'll take a full medical history from you. So they're medical professionals, herbal experts. And then they'll look at your symptoms and they'll prescribe something that is like going to help you. you. Exactly. Rather than it being off the shelf. Right. And then things like cognitive behavioural therapy. So that's really about sort of how you think about what's happening to you. And if you have some coping strategies for when you're experiencing a hot flush, because for a lot of people, they'll have the hot flush, heart starts to pound, they start to get anxious, getting anxious makes it worse. Right. So if you can break that cycle by giving somebody some resources and tools that they can use, so it might be that they're going to focus their breathing, it might be that they're going to ground themselves in some way, shape or form, it can really help them the hot flushes aren't going to stop, yeah. but it can help them to manage them. So there are definitely... Some people find that cold water swimming really helps. Yeah, yeah. I've started doing that. You know, cold Andrea's been doing that, haven't you? Yeah. What, like doing literally in legs the, from that? Yeah, I started in January in the swimming pool, outside swimming pool. And it, and it helps? Yeah, and it's uh, actually it's made made my brain fog better as well, I have to say, yeah. But also things like bedding, you can... Ch- yeah. Wool, wool bedding is recommended. For, wool bedding. Wool bedding, Seems to natural fibers, yeah, and you know you can have a fan in your room um, when you're working. Just have a fan on your desk, things like that. A lot of people have try, tried those cool pads. Yeah, I've tried they? the cool pads. Yeah, so there are cool pads that you can kind <coughs> of put Stick under your fridge, sheet yeah. or under your pillow. Yeah, people they work find right. people, some people find that they help. I mean, yeah. I don't think there's even HRT. Yeah, even though it's it first just line might treatment, ease it a little bit. It's not. It's not a miracle. It's not magic. It's about finding the right combination of, if it's HRT, or the right combination of if you want to go the herbal route. But I think the most important thing is that people have factual, evidence-based information yeah. that allows everybody to make an informed choice. Different things will suit different people. Yep. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Yep. So what, what might be good for you might not be good for yeah. someone else. And sometimes yeah. it can take a few goes to find... The right sort of mix. So it can take a while. I think people need to understand it takes a bit of patience I think the other thing that's really important is self-care. Yeah. So, and we're talking specifically about women, but I think it's equally important for men. You know, many of us arrive at this time in our lives. We've juggled a lot of plates. We might still be juggling a lot of plates. There might be a lot going on in our lives. Some people will still have children at home. Others will be, you know, many will be working full time. Some might have elderly relatives who need more care and support. You know, it's been a tricky old world the last few years, hasn't it? No Um, doubt about that. So I think, you know, kind of we've all experienced anxiety in one way, shape or form. We also have to remember that there are going to be some individuals when they get to this perimenopausal stage, it's a stage where they don't feel in control. So, I mean, this is a huge subject. I'm just going to touch on it. For some people, they will find that past traumas are triggered for them because it's a time in their lives when they weren't in control. Yeah. And this is another time in their life. So although those right. things might not be aligned, it's the idea of not having control. Yeah. Those feelings come back. So it's really important that people do, and it's a difficult thing to do in a 24-7 world yeah. where you've got news coming at you all the time, you know, we're all really busy trying to, you know, carry on on the hamster wheel, trying to make some, like, small changes, little micro changes where you're taking, like, a little bit more time for yourself. I think for a lot of women, they're not very good at it because they've spent their lives caring for other people. But even saying to somebody it's okay and that they can give themselves permission to do that. And I think as far as partners are concerned, very often with partners, they're desperate to try and help. So they try and fix stuff. They're trying to and make it right. The stuff they're as well. trying to make it right. 
they're trying to do what they think their partner needs without the information of what their partner really needs. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. what we often say is where you can try and say, this is what I'm experiencing. This is what I need right now. I just wanted to finally, what reassurance can you give to women who are listening and watching and who are really fed up, depressed and suffering on a daily basis? Is there light at the end of the tunnel? Does menopause really last up to 10 years in some cases? Why do we not have more research and investment in the field? And is there like more coming? Can we see like the government or health organ health um, organisations being more interested in putting more stuff into it or is, is this it? This isn't, you know, the end of it and you're not going to feel like this forever. But like we keep saying, get the education, read everything. We've got lots of resources on our website that people can go and download. As soon as you feel like you know what's going on, you feel stronger in yourself and you feel empowered and then you can decide what you want to do about it. First thing I would say is you're not alone. Whether you're going through this directly <coughs> or whether you're trying to support somebody, you're not alone. Contact somebody whether it's an organisation like us, whether it's a friend, whether it's a family member, you know, talk to somebody because that usually helps to initially relieve the pressure. As far as, you know, as I said, research in women's health has been dire forever. Yeah. Um, so hopefully things are starting to change, but we've got a long way to go. Are there good things coming? Well, there are good things coming because in about I'm told about 18 months' time, for those people who don't want HRT or they can't consider it, there is a new, completely new treatment coming, which is a non-hormonal treatment. So it's in the final stages of research and development and testing. So it should be to the market quite soon. Yeah. So particularly for anybody who's had an estrogen receptive cancer, they can very much kind of feel, oh, well, that's it. There's nothing for me. Actually, there is something coming for you, which is really encouraging. Um, around government, so as Andrea said, you know, we've achieved having it included in the school curriculum. So hopefully all young people will learn about menopause going forward. Um, we know that medical students are going to learn about it. And then as far as the other aims are concerned, the workplace, things are definitely changing. So one of the things that we do at Menopause Support, as well as our kind of one-to-one -one support for individuals, is we provide educational training for businesses and organisations. We're doing more and more of that. We really need this piece around GP education for everybody. And ultimately, the aim is to have sort of parity of care for everybody, that care and support, and it's to have that good quality care and support free at the point of need. Before we go, is there, can you give us information? Where can people get hold of you? Where can they find you guys? Well, the Facebook group is the Menopause Support Network and you will have to answer a few questions to join. They're just security questions yeah. to make sure that everyone's safe in the group. Yeah. Um, and then our website is menopausesupport.co.uk. Um, I've got quite an unusual surname, yes. so you'll be able to find me on yep. things like yep. Instagram, Instagram and yep. LinkedIn. Yep. There's only yep. one Dan Easy. Brink. <laughs> Easy. It's at the Menopause Support, That's it. isn't it, yep. on Instagram? Yeah. So, so and we and, post regularly. And, and listen, make, hashtag make, look, look at the T-shirt. Make menopause matter. Yeah? Sign the petition. Sign the petition. Sign the petition. Sign the petition, all right? Before we go, is there anything else you want to add before we go? Um, for me, I just want to say thank you. I want to say thank you for opening up your platform to talk about this because it's so important to have a guy who recognises how important this is and hopefully this is going to educate and inform a lot more people. I, I, I was in a situation where I thought, hold on, I don't understand enough about this. Do you know what I mean? Across the board with friends, family, girlfriend, and I, just, I, I thought I needed to, 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 learn, to learn more. Do you know what I mean? So I've and it just and that's it. In. It just takes someone like you to think, right? I'm just going to stick my like you said, stick my head out, and I'm going to say, right? We need to talk about this, and we really appreciate that. And this can be your apology for all those comments that you've made. In the <laughs> <laughs> you've made up for it. <laughs> Sorry, girls. On that note, I want to thank everyone for locking in today. If you look underneath the video, I'm going to have as much information as possible of. Um, of where you can go for help, support, education. I'll have the, um, the information of Diane and Andrea down there as well. And um, yeah, once again, thank you for looking into the Frost Report. Till next time, peace, we out.
I get high, I get high of your memories. 